Hello from the Centre for Livable Cities in Singapore and a warm welcome to the eighth episode in our CLC webinar series, Cities Adapting to a Disrupted World. I'm your host, Dinesh Naidu. Our distinguished speaker today is Ms. Sharon Dijksma, Deputy Mayor for the City of Amsterdam, and she will be speaking on Amsterdam leading the way towards Carlite cities. Before we dive in, let me cover some housekeeping matters. Simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available for this webinar. To access this, please click on the interpretation tab on your Zoom toolbar and then select Chinese. Following the Deputy Mayor's presentation, Ambassador Marit Vono, Ambassador to Singapore and Brunei for the Kingdom of the Netherlands, will moderate the dialogue and audience Q&A. You can pose questions to them using the Q&A tab. If you'd like a copy, the Deputy Mayor's slides can be downloaded from our CLC website. I'm now honoured to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Ms. Sharon Dijksma, Deputy Mayor for Traffic and Transport, Water and Air Quality for the City of Amsterdam. The Deputy Mayor has been in her current role since 2018. Her previous roles include Secretary of State for Education, Culture and Science, Minister for Agriculture, and Minister for Infrastructure and Environment. The Deputy Mayor has worked at both national and local levels, and she told us that she loves her current role because cities are game changers for issues like climate change. She also walks the talk and cycles for both work and leisure. Without further ado, Deputy Mayor Sharon Dijksma, the mic is yours. Hello everybody, and um, as you maybe know, Amsterdam is growing rapidly and will continue to grow. But I have to tell you that um, success also has its drawbacks. Uh, and the growing numbers of uh, Amsterdamers, visitors and tourists are putting uh, increasing pressure on the public spaces. And I would like to um, uh, give you a kind of uh, insight in what uh, the city of Amsterdam has to do to ensure that we remain a safe, livable city. And at the same time, uh, we keep the public spaces accessible and appealing. So um, I think that um, uh, we try to go now to our first uh, slide. And that is uh, about creating space in Amsterdam, an agenda for a livable and accessible city. And as I already mentioned, um, the key aim of this agenda is uh, creating space. Space uh, to walk, uh, space to cycle, which a lot of Amsterdamers do. Uh, space also for children to play and to enjoy our green spaces so that Amsterdam can continue to be an accessible and livable city for the next 20 years. A place uh, where people want to live, where they want to work, and where they are also able to uh, relax. And to achieve this, we're reducing the amount of space given to cars in our city. And the agenda for a livable and accessible city includes targeted practical measures for our streets, and for innovative experimentation. And I have to say that it identifies the main points that we still need to work on. It shows uh, what we are doing uh, now, and that is the period until 2022. Soon, this will be the period until 2025. And as we say later, and this is the period until 2040 to build on what has already uh, been uh, achieved. Um, I um, uh, want to tell you what are the key uh, goals uh, of our uh, agenda for a livable and accessible uh, city. Um, first, uh, the goal uh, I want to um, elaborate upon is to um, enjoy um, more uh, spending time in the city. So what we need um, is uh, a spatial reallocation to benefit the quality of the public space by adding more green space or play uh, facilities. And on the slide, you can see how we are trying to, uh, to do this in our uh, city. Um, next goal um, is um, more space for facilities. The space that has been created can be used for facilities such as, for instance, waste containers, 
most of the time we try to put them, uh, the biggest part of them, under the ground, under the surface, but also bicycle stands, because we have a lot of uh, bicycles. Uh, I think that approximately every inhabitant of Amsterdam has more than one bicycle per person. And um, uh, we need, for instance, loading and unloading areas also for the transport of, of goods. Um, the third goal is uh, more space for clean and active forms of transport. And you see here uh, not only bicycling uh, people, but also a public transport, because this is one of the uh, main uh, issues for us. Public transport is in the heart of our agenda. We really need it uh, to uh, have people uh, uh, have accessibility to mobility. And uh, therefore, this is something we heavily invest uh, in. Then uh, um, uh, the fourth uh, goal is cleaner air. Um, uh, we need uh, less noise pollution, uh, we need a better traffic safety, and uh, the measures in this agenda are helping us to reduce car traffic and by that making our air cleaner and our roads more efficient. And why do we need this? Unfortunately, at this moment, still in nine streets in uh, Amsterdam, in my city, we are not able to live up to the standards that the European law requires from us uh, on air pollution and air quality. So we really need to step up here. Um, then um, um, uh, the fifth goal, and that is an inclusive city for young and old, high income and low income. So we need to make sure that everybody is able to travel from A to B comfortably, but also affordably. Now, let me take you into some of the trends and developments that we are um, uh, facing uh, over the last uh, years. First of all, this is our region, the metropole region of Amsterdam. Um, we are facing a major growth challenge. Uh, we need to build 290,000 extra homes by the year 2040. And if we do not take action, the number of guard journeys will also grow. And that will reduce the quality of life and also the accessibility of our city. Uh, we have a lot of traffic jams already in our country. We're a small country with a lot of inhabitants and our metropole area is uh, uh, crowded, so to say. So if more people would take the car, then we will have a, uh, a huge um, uh, problem. Then um, um, I think that, that you will see uh, that the uh, demand uh, for space is uh, enormous. And it is the highest inside our A10 ring road to the south of the river, the Eye. So at the slide, you see by lightning how dense actually uh, the use of our public space is. And actually, it's all lightened. So it means that uh, um, uh, we have uh, highly densely populated and heavily used public uh, space. And uh, this is why we need to uh, reduce the footprint of cars in our city in terms of space uh, emissions and also uh, noise. Um, we are a cycling uh, uh, city. And um, uh, I think that um, uh, th that is very good. But at the same time, we see that cars require still uh, the largest amount of space per user. And this is why uh, um, uh, it is so important uh, to do something about it. And if you see this, you see that a car which is driving by approximately 50 kilometers per hour, it takes a lot of space. But even still uh, a car which is parked takes more space than, for instance, a bus or a tram. And uh, if you compare it to pedestrians or, uh, or bikers, then you will see the big uh, difference. Um, um, I mentioned it, uh, we are a cycling uh, a city and uh, we see that car use has been declining since 1986 and residents mainly use their bikes to get around uh, the city, everybody does it. And uh, with the increase in number of inhabitants in our city, the numbers of cars in the city grew for years. 
And in 2015, for the first time, there is a slight decrease in this number. And we see that especially the new generation, so young people, do not own a car anymore. Because of this development, uh, bicycle use, uh, usage in Amsterdam increased enormously, whereas the usage of public transport has decreased. Um, trips made to and from Amsterdam are still often made by car. And this is why a regional approach uh, is uh, so important. So a car uh, is necessary for some people and there are sometimes no alternatives for them, uh, especially not alternatives by public transport. So we really need to work on this uh, too. Um, now uh, I will uh, take you into uh, our agenda and how step by step we try to um, improve the livability and accessibility of our city. It is, uh, as I mentioned, a step by step uh, approach. Um, uh, first um, uh, step um, uh, is uh, more clean and active modes in the city. I think this is a no brainer for everybody. Secondly, making space by reducing car trips. Then thirdly, uh, we are going to make more space due to fewer parked cars. Um, it is our aim until 2025 to reduce about 10,000 public cars park spaces in our city. And uh, this is a heavy task. It's not easy, uh, but we are re really um, on track, so to say. And the fourth step uh, in our agenda is to create pleasant uh, public uh, spaces. And now I would like to give you a quick overview of some measures that we are taking, and I will not go all through them. You see the three periods here, the period in the next two years, the period now, soon, and later. And if you look into this, you see that we try, for instance, to increase frequencies uh, of the metro, uh, uh, to have more uh, uh, 30 kilometer limits for, car, uh, for cars in the streets, uh, reduce, I already mentioned, the number of parking uh, permits. Uh, we have a lot of uh, shared economy uh, in our city. So we have, for instance, uh, shared bicycles at metro stations. We're working with a pilot on it. Uh, we try to tackle the top 15 uh, pedestrian uh, button nets and so on and so on. So um, you see that we really have an agenda also in time, but also a, a strategy um, behind it. Uh, COVID, of course, um, has uh, an, uh, uh, um, affected our city heavily, uh, as a lot of cities in uh, the world. And uh, the COVID pandemic um, uh, has, has really brandmarked us um, uh, in the way uh, that we have to reorganize our public space. Due to our uh, density and high number of inhabitants and visitors, Amsterdam is very vulnerable in terms of spreading the virus. And furthermore, the economy of Amsterdam is uh, much reliant on tourism and also the creative industry. So that are two sectors that have been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic shows, however, that we need more space than ever to make sure the virus cannot spread. We need to have space to keep 1.5 meter distance, which is the aim for the Netherlands government and also for the government of the city of Amsterdam. Um, I think that um, uh, we have uh, some principles uh, in dealing with reallocation of public space uh, as uh, we need it for um, making uh, um, uh, or taking or implementing, so to say, the COVID-19 uh, uh, measures. I think that we are uh, clear that uh, the pandemic should not be misused to create or to implement new policies, which could not be implemented before uh, the pandemic. We try to fit the current measures with the existing policy plans. And this means that COVID-19 measures in the public space favor pedestrians and cyclists over cars and does not mean more room for cars because we see at the moment that people try to to take more and more the car because they want to avoid, for instance, public transport. 
Secondly, we use an integral approach uh, to the crisis, which means that the different disciplines work together um, to solve challenges caused by the pandemic. For example, the traffic department works together with the education department to ensure a safe arrival and departure at school by the closing of streets around the schools. And um, the pandemic is a urgent reason for people to change their travel behavior to work and school, as more people, we see this already by now, will work and study from home. And in the Netherlands, we try to speak with schools and employers about changing study and work hours in order to decrease uh, the pressure on our rushing hours. And uh, after this conference, I will have a big assignment uh, uh, ceremony with uh, people from public transport and all the big um, uh, schools and universities in our city uh, to have some good deal about this, avoiding rush hour and creating more um, uh, spreading of working hours. Um, measures to create more space for pedestrians and bicycles, um, that is a challenge in our old city center. Uh, we cannot take uh, drastic measures, but um, uh, we try uh, to do our utmost uh, best. Um, examples uh, of interdisciplinary measures, you can see it here on uh, the slides. Uh, a temporary parking permits for healthcare professionals, for instance, we, I think, delivered 10,000 of them in the past months. Making bicycles available for teachers and for students, uh, who, uh, especially uh, uh, students who cannot afford a bike uh, by themselves, for instance. Now, I would uh, take you to my last uh, uh, slide. Um, uh, we have uh, some uh, examples of mobility measures taken to prevent uh, spreading uh, the pandemic. Uh, we made sure that, for instance, pedestrians get more space. Uh, cyclists temporarily could use uh, car lanes. Uh, we temporarily closed parking spaces along the streets to create, for instance, more room for terraces for pedestrians. Uh, we have created uh, shared spaces to create more space for pedestrians in, for instance, the Nine Streets, which is in a famous street in Amsterdam. And uh, we closed off residential streets for cars to enable residents to play, sit and eat in their street and have uh, like livable streets um, uh, for themselves. And of course, last but not least, we make sure that our public transport in the city is as clean and as safe as possible to ensure people reliable on public transport to travel safety. So this would be uh, the end of my presentation. I hope that you got a, a, a short oversight of all the work that we are doing at the moment, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, for sharing Amsterdam's story. Uh, it's, it's really inspiring to see a city which has achieved so much and yet remains so ambitious and hungry to do even more. Uh, incidentally, I love the sign that says, cars are guests in this street. Next, let's review yeah. the results <laughs> of our poll. In the waiting room, we asked our audience, will COVID-19 push us closer to or further from the concept of car-like cities. I think the results show an audience that is pragmatic and slightly optimistic. Less than 10% thought that the pandemic will take us further from the concept of car-like cities, but more than a third of you thought it will take us closer to this ideal. The majority feel it will vary from city to city depending on the local circumstances, which really points to the role of local planning and governance. And I think this brings us nicely to the next segment, which is our moderated dialogue. Let me now welcome and introduce our guest moderator today, Ambassador Mahrit Vono. Ambassador uh, Vono has been in office since 2017. She began her career at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has held various positions in New York, Washington DC, Brussels and The Hague. The ambassador was a member of the advisory board of the International Cycling Conference Velocity and board member of the Dutch Association of Public Management. Ambassador Vono has worked with the deputy minister on several occasions, one of which was at the Netherlands Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. CLC has worked closely with the Dutch embassy on many occasions, including CLC's lecture series and the World City Summit, 
and we are grateful to be working together again on this webinar. Without further ado, Ambassador Vono, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Dinesh. It's a pleasure to be here. Normally, with my friends in Singapore, we cycle on Sundays. Now it's still uh, only with a couple of friends, and it's great to have so many of us here online. You know, Sharon, Deputy Mayor, I think there are people from about 50 countries, so from all over the place. And I think we all are interested in learning how can we improve our own city. And you've shown us already uh, some wonderful examples. Um, let me start, we, we, we go a long way back. I think it was 1992 <laughs> that I met you for the first time. Um, the deputy mayor was then the youth representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations General Assembly. We had that as the Dutch. She had a roaring speech and I thought, wow, this is a new minister because she were already at the Socialist Party and it all came through. And it's great that you're still so active in public life and that I can ask you questions like, how do you actually make this happen? Because I'm an avid cyclist myself. I've cycled like in New York, Paris, Singapore, Netherlands, and sometimes the cycling lane just stops. So as a public planner, I know that there are different layers of government who are working together and that it's also national level that you need and that you have different agency. I know that like here in Singapore, you have the Land Transport Authority, Urban Redevelopment Authority, Housing Development Board, they all have to work together to get the park connectors, which is the cycling lanes here. Could you give us some examples about when it worked, but also how you struggled? Because I know it's not easy to get all those agencies or levels of government together. Yes, uh, well, thank you, uh, Margriet. It's, it's so nice to, to uh, be active together with you in this uh, webinar. Um, I, to answer your question, I think that a collaboration between the different uh, parts of government, whether it's regional, local or national, is key. If, if we do not collaborate together in order to make a plan uh, for, for, for bicycles and for, for instance, for park spaces for bicycles near to stations or for roads uh, for bicycles, uh, dedicated roads, so to say, dedicated lanes for bikers between our cities, then we would end up nowhere. So it is really necessary to collaborate. And what we struggle with is not the vision, because I think that if you look in to our country that we all love our bikes. I mean, it is not only a, a habit in Amsterdam, so to say. I think that you will find many people in our country using their bike for especially the small uh, um, uh, kilometer tracks. And, and we try uh, on a no national level, also our government, to stimulate it. So we agree on, on what the strategy should be. So this is the easy part. The difficult part is that we always have a lack of money. And this is costly because, for instance, at all our stations, we need more and more parking spaces for bikes. And we cannot put them all in public space. So we need to really build like garage. That is what we do in the Netherlands for only bikes. So this is something uh, which is interesting. Uh, like in Utrecht, we built the biggest um, garage for bikes worldwide. So thousands and thousands of students, uh, people who uh, use bikes for their work to go to the station use this. And uh, it costs a lot of money and there is always uh, a lot more ambition than there is money. But we uh, uh, were able to organize it when I was a minister uh, at the infrastructure um, uh, department and also now the current minister uh, for infrastructure heavily invests in this. And uh, this is how we try to, to even bring the agenda uh, further. And what, for instance, national government also is doing is looking at our taxes and how we can, for instance, stimulate people to buy a bike uh, um, uh, for their work instead of a car. So these kind of measures uh, are important to, to help each other. Thank you very much. And I know that you personally are also very geared towards social inclusion and that it's part of your policy uh, in this COVID times to, to help people who need extra support. But sometimes uh, I think there the principle is very 
laudable and everybody agrees, but could you tell me in practice, how do you help people? Do you give them a bike? Do you give them some vouchers or do you encourage them? How do you reach those persons and what can you as the vice mayor of Amsterdam do? Yeah, for instance, um, uh, we have a, uh, an issue in the public transport in the beginning because we wanted to, to keep up the 1.5 meter uh, society. And in public transport, that is obviously difficult because there is not a lot of space. So if you need to have people with vital uh, professions to use it, and not having all the students at the same time in public transport, you need to encourage them or tempt them even to use a bike. But we know that in our city, uh, in parts of our city, uh, young people uh, grew, grow up uh, uh, being poor, unfortunately. And they uh, have no parents who can afford a bike. So what we did in cooperation with my colleague uh, of education is that we, uh, together with some uh, companies, provided, uh, I think, 1,600 bikes uh, as a loan uh, for those students who needed to bike instead of using public transport, but were not able to afford the bike. Secondly, what we also do if it comes to, for instance, social inclusion is that we help people who are for uh, having, when they have a disability, for instance, to, to better use public transport. So we have uh, a, a public transport coaches who try to help people to find out their way in public transport, for instance, when they have bad sight or are even totally blind and cannot see and are afraid to use the public transport because they are not able to know what is coming ahead of them. So uh, we invest in this so that we make people um, uh, independent, actually. And that is also a form of social inclusion. If you are able to make your own choices and your own uh, steps, literally, uh, that is also a form of social inclusion. And thirdly, I think that, yes, we want to be a car light city, true. But at the same time, we know that some people are dependent on their cars. So if you, for instance, have a handicap permit license with your car, uh, we uh, will be uh, allowing you not only to uh, put your car on the street in a public uh, place, but we also uh, provide things free for you. So if you, for instance, are a visitor with a handicap permit car um, uh, um, license, then you will be able to uh, uh, park your car in Amsterdam free um, if, if you uh, um, um, uh, register for this. So uh, we want not only to be a, uh, a green and a, a sustainable city, but we also want to be a social city. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. Before we go to the questions uh, from the public, I have one last question myself. I know that infrastructure is very, very costly, but also very pivotal in going to the next level. Uh, in Asia, for example, sometimes it's difficult to get public-private partnerships. Some local cities are struggling with that. Can you give some examples about how does Amsterdam raise the money for all these investments? And where you struggle and what are your best practices? Well, we, we struggle with this, obviously. This is also for us a difficult issue because at the one hand, we would say that, for instance, uh, creating public spaces or uh, organizing public transport is really a public task. And you would not be too dependent on, uh, for instance, companies because you want to manage your own public space. At the same time, uh, if you cooperate with, with, with companies, uh, you can make uh, a, a lot more happen. So what we, for instance, try to do if it comes to our uh, sharing economy is we cooperate with uh, those companies who have uh, shared cars as a uh, um, uh, uh, possibility. And we give them a permit and then they pay for um, 
being able to have uh, their um, work in the streets of Amsterdam to 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 be able to um, uh, interest and tempt people to use their uh, uh, sharing cars, so to say. And at the same time, if as a person you would use such a car, you can park everywhere. So you do not have to pay for this. And uh, so in this, we cooperate with, uh, for instance, uh, companies in order to have less cars because they uh, uh, um, uh, offer uh, shared cars and they pay uh, the city of Amsterdam to be able to do this. And as a uh, inhabitant, uh, you can have a, uh, a monthly amount that you pay for this. And of course you pay for the use of the car. But this is something which really is uh, growing rapidly because the youngest generation do not want to own a car. They only need to sometimes use it. And we will see a shift, I think, in coming years in the sharing economy. So more and more people will use things instead of own things. And that is, I think, uh, an interesting development. And in this, we heavily cooperate with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, companies, private companies. Thank you. Then we go to questions from the public. The first one um, comes from uh, Kairula Abdul Razak from Singapore. Uh, he's interested in learning more on the economic viabilities of the car light approach. Is it efficient? Um, I would say yes. <laughs> I think that um, uh, what the, the problem is, is that if we would have too many cars in our city and too many traffic jams, that would be a heavy burden on our economy. So if, if uh, our mobility is running smoothly, and if only those people who need really the car for, uh, for instance, uh, um, bringing goods to our city would use it, and they would have a free floating access to our city and not a, a loss of time, then that is uh, something which is really uh, um, benefiting our economy. So in the long term, having too many traffic jams and having a non-accessible city is bad for the economy. Well, that's a clear answer. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Then we have another question from the public, uh, from uh, Ms. Anita Ai from Singapore. Uh, and I like this question because it's about sometimes some streets are closed in Amsterdam and then the inhabitants can just enjoy, get their kids to play, so what is a major factor when it comes to deciding which streets to close? Is it cost or how do you decide? No, I would say it's not cost which is our biggest issue. It, it would be safety. Because if we would close down streets for cars, then we need to um, uh, invest first and investigate uh, and do a lot of research. Where would those cars go to? And would that be a safer alternative than the use of the particular street? So I would think that safety of the streets and of the inhabitants who are, are using the street is actually the first and uh, foremost uh, issue in which we try to decide whether a street has to be closed down for cars, for instance. Because if they would use uh, little streets in the neighborhood and there would be uh, playing children in that little streets and they would be uh, having a lot more cars uh, uh, in, in, in the front of them, and then that would be not a, a good decision. So we always use not only our own data, to see what would be the um, uh, behavior of the car owners who are not able to drive there anymore. But we also, for instance, discuss this with the police, with the local police, uh, with the, the uh, organization of the bikers and all kinds of other um, uh, people with having ex expertise on this to see whether it would be responsible to do so. Thank you. Um... Then we have a question from Camelia Balkis, who's from Semarang. Hi, Camelia, good to have you here. And it's a question on how to improve public transport resilience during the COVID-19 outbreak. You already referred to it briefly, but I think this is what a lot of cities uh, struggle with at the moment. Yes, yes, and we do that too. 
uh, I have to tell you that is not easy because at the same time uh, we need people to use public transport because if everybody who would previously use public transport now would take the car, we would have a, a, a big issue with, with uh, our accessibility of the city. So we need to, to, to encourage and tempt people to still use public transport. And what we do is that we have, uh, um, for instance, at one hand, uh, um, uh, some regulation in which you need to, 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 to uh, apply, uh, use hygiene measurements, uh, heavily hygiene measurements when you um, are entering uh, public transport. Uh, we tried to, to have a maximum of capacity uh, so that uh, public transport will not, especially in rush hour, be too crowded. And therefore, it's so uh, important to uh, make uh, some appointments about it uh, and, and, and have a gr agreement with, with uh, uh, universities, but also big employers and our own city to avoid people to, to, to take public transport in rush hours when that is not really necessary. And uh, thirdly, uh, we have a huge debate with our national government because you see now that the many public transport uh, organizations or companies also here in Amsterdam are struggling to uh, um, even survive, so to say, also financially, because they have less income, uh, because less people use public transport. And we have some arrangements for at least this year and this afternoon, I have to negotiate again with our Ministry of Infrastructure for next year uh, to, to provide uh, for public transport companies also a, a kind of fee or a kind of help, financial help to keep them going. Thank you. I have one final question from the public. It's from Mr. Chong, uh, Wen Wei. Um, uh, it's a question I'm smiling when I see it. So. Um, how are the drivers reacting to your car light uh, uh, new policy? Do you have some upheavals or is there great acceptance of this new way forward? Well, um, the, the, we've we done a lot of survey on this and this is really something which is interesting because when we uh, started with this policy, you saw that it gave a huge debate in our country. So I was all over national TV uh, and everybody has an opinion on this and, and also critical opinions. But the issue was that most of those uh, critical opinions came not from people who are living in our city. So it came from the people from outside, so to say. So in the city uh, itself, because of the fact that so many people already use their bike or are pedestrians or use public transport, there is a great acceptance that the cars should be the guests in the street, as the moderator uh, also uh, remembered us. That, that is one of our slogans. And, and they are not dominating. And I think that this acceptance makes it possible to be so ambitious, but we need to always take into account the public view. So uh, that is why we, for instance, for people who are having a, uh, a problem, who are disabled, uh, to, uh, to, to, who really need their car, it should be always possible to use your car. So we are not anti-car, so to say. We try to give more space for other um, uh, forms of mobility because they are the ones, the pedestrians, the bikers, uh, the children who need to have space on the streets to even play, who are at this moment the most vulnerable. And I think that that uh, is highly accepted in the city. And many people uh, uh, have been voting for those parties who had this in their agenda. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure hosting you as a moderator. Um, I'm now a little bit homesick for Amsterdam, if I see that lovely picture and hear what you're doing there. So, uh, well, in post-COVID time, uh, I'll visit uh, again. Now over to Dinesh. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Margriet. Thank you both uh, Deputy Mayor Sharon Dijksma and Ambassador Vono for that very energetic discussion. I uh, enjoyed it thoroughly and I think we are so privileged to have you here today because we really got some insights that I think only you as uh, Deputy Mayor could give us, especially from a political perspective on how you have handled and managed some of these things. Thank you so much. Uh, our next webinar is um, co-organized with our
partner, the World Bank, and will be in two weeks on the 10th of September. It is titled Seeding a Food Secure Future. Our distinguished speaker is Martin Van Newkoop, World Bank's Global Director for Agriculture and Food Global Practice. He will share how cities and multilateral banks can keep food accessible and affordable in the global food system in an era of global disruptions, including uh, pandemics as well as the climate crisis. Chintan Raveshia, Cities Planning and Design Leader, Southeast Asia at Arup, will moderate this webinar. Please register to attend using the QR code or the link. This webinar has been live streamed on CLC's Facebook page and we'll upload a recording of it uh, by tonight, Singapore time in a few hours on our CLC YouTube channel, where you can find almost 600 other videos, including several related to the topic of car -like cities. Finally, thank you as always, dear viewers, for your participation. Uh, before you leave, please use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form to tell us what works and how we can do better. We've come to the end of today's webinar, but we will be leaving this room open for another 10 minutes. Feel free to exchange comments with each other using the chat box. Until our next webinar on the 10th of September, goodbye and stay healthy.